morning, everybody. Good morning. I want to welcome you all today as our kids are headed out to children's ministry. Uh, my name is uh, Mike. I'm one of the pastors here at Crossroad, and we are in uh, week two of a brand new message series we just started called Christian, as you saw on the screen there. And what we are talking about in this series is the fact that the word Christian has kind of been co-opted by our culture. And so now people use the word Christian all over the place, and the meaning is not helpful. And maybe it's time we rethought this whole Christian thing. So that's what we're going to talk about today. And and as I said, we're in week two. And so those of you joining us online today, those of you in the room, we're so thankful you're here. Thank you for making time to come and hear God speak and challenge you personally this morning. Uh, Many of you are familiar with an uh, an author named Anne Rice. Anybody ever heard of Anne Rice? Uh, She wrote a a series of books. She's written more than 30 books, actually. And she has sold more than 90 million copies of books, okay? This woman has has made her money (laughs) in literature and and movies, too. Most of you, maybe you're familiar with the movie uh, Interview with a Vampire. uh, That was one of her books that was turned into a movie. And uh, the, the... Interview with the Vampire, actually, I just read this morning, is coming out in a new series on uh, AMC. Uh, they're, they're releasing this new series on AMC, uh, Interview with the Vampire. I do not recommend it for, for families with children. I haven't seen it, but just what I read about it, it may not be appropriate for kids, okay? Then again, neither is the movie that came out in 1994. So, uh, Anne was raised in the church, and at 18, uh, in her words, she violently and totally left Christianity, just abandoned the faith, pursued her literary career, did quite well, obviously. And in 1999, something very funny happened in 1999. She came back to the church. She came back to faith. And she committed her writing skills to the Lord. And she began to write books with Christian themes. She wrote fiction books on the life of Jesus. And, uh, and uh, she began to write about Christianity and, and Jesus and the church. And the story of how she came back is actually quite fascinating. She became interested historically in the Jewish people. Like, out of all the ancient cultures, how did the Jews survive? How did the Jews make it out of the chaos of the ancient world and and continue to thrive in the modern world? Especially after their temple was destroyed by the Romans in 70 AD. So, just for those to catch everybody up on the same page, what happened was that uh, Israel was part of the Roman Empire. So Jesus, you remember, was crucified by Pontius Pilate, who was a Roman governor. And um, in about 70 AD, 68 AD, the Jews rebelled against Rome. They tried to win their independence. Long story short, it didn't go well. (laughs) The Romans marched in a couple of legions of troops under General Titus, who just wiped out uh, all of the opposition armies and um, laid siege to the city of Jerusalem, And when he finally broke through the walls of Jerusalem, slaughtered thousands of Jews in the city, carted off thousands more back to Rome to be slaves to the Roman Empire, it was bad. So given this, and and then to make it even worse, he tore down the temple, the Jerusalem temple, they ripped it down stone by stone so there was nothing left. And, And Anne's question was, how did Judaism survive this cataclysmic event? And she was looking for sources in the ancient world that would talk about this, And she thought to herself, well, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John were written about this time, the Gospels. So she went to the Gospels and started reading them to find out more about ancient Judaism. And then she started interacting with other Christian writers and authors and talking to Christian historians. And through that process, she rediscovered faith, or or maybe faith rediscovered her. And uh, she re-embraced Christianity. And in 2008, she wrote another book. Uh, the, the title was, was called Out of Darkness, and it is her memoir, her spiritual confession about how she grew up Catholic and then left the church, and then how God brought her back again, how she rediscovered faith. And I want to share a couple of paragraphs in that book this morning as we get started, uh, because what she's going to talk about are some really common barriers to faith that I'm willing many of you in here have wrestled with yourselves. Now, we're jumping in the middle of a conversation here. She, she's talking about all of the huge things that caused her problems for so many years, trying to love God and follow his people, but what finally brought her back around. Okay, so here's what she writes. I want you to, I want you to hear from Anne this morning. She says, he, that's God, knew how or why everything happened. He knew the disposition of every single soul. He wasn't going to let anything happen by accident. Nobody was going to go to hell by mistake. This was his world, all of this. He had complete 
control of it. His justice, his mercy. They were not our justice or our mercy. And what folly to even imagine such a thing. Now, this is huge. I mean, some of you listening today, maybe what Anne's wrestling with here might be worth the price of admission just, just for this, okay? Because I'm willing to bet that everybody in here has wrestled with this stuff at one time or another in your life. Like the justice of God, the mercy of God. How does it work? What about all those people who fill in the blank and didn't understand how or why it all worked? And Anne, after wrestling for dec- literally decades with this, she came to the conclusion that I don't have to know all the answers. She, she continues, listen. I didn't have to know how he was going to save the unlettered and the unbaptized or how he would redeem the conscientious heathen who had never spoken his name. I didn't have to know how my gay friends would find their way to redemption or how my hardworking secular humanist friends could or would receive the power of his saving grace. I didn't have to know why good people sometimes suffered agony or died in pain. He knew. And it was his knowing that overwhelmed me. His knowing that became completely real to me. Again, some of you listening, these these words are for you. Listen as she wraps this up. And why should I remain apart from him just because I couldn't grasp all of this? He could grasp it. Now, that's profound. You can tell there were decades of wrestling behind that quote. It took her a long time to get to that point. But in just those couple of paragraphs, Anne Rice tackles some of the biggest struggles and religious questions that so many people wrestle with today. People for years have been struggling with this. And her answer to those questions? Her answer is, if God is anything like Jesus in the Bible, then I can trust him to make the right call. I can trust him. I don't have to have all the answers. Now, before I move on, I have to just, I just want to say this real quick. If you are sitting here today or listening online, and you're one of those people who has like dismissed faith, it's kind of a myth, like this whole Christian thing, it's all just made up, and it's all baloney, and you can't trust the Bible, and you, maybe you had a professor in college, or you watched a video on YouTube or TikTok, and somebody just ripped apart faith, and, and they spent their 15 minutes destroying it, and it just wrecked your faith, and you're like, yeah, I'm not sure I believe any of that anymore. Maybe you need to take another look. Anne Rice is way smarter than your college English professor. <laughs> in fact, your college professor might be sitting in a church this morning going, oh, I wish I hadn't done that to all those kids over the years. <laughs> you see, Anne came back to the church. She rediscovered faith. And this is a smart lady. She's no dummy, okay? She's a historian. She did her homework. But here's something interesting that happened. So she comes back to the church. Ten years go by. And then in 2010, she quit. She quit Christianity. She posted this on Facebook. I want you to hear from Anne this morning again. She said, today, I quit being a Christian. I'm out. I remain committed to Christ as always, but not to being Christian or being any part of Christianity. And you read this and you're like, wait, what? <laughs> like, this is so confusing. Like, you're committed to Christ, but you're not committed to Christianity? I mean, can you even do that? Is that allowed? She goes on. She says, It's simply impossible for me to belong to this quarrelsome, hostile, disputatious, and deservedly infamous group. In other words, I love Jesus, she says, but I don't like the quarreling. I don't like the hostility. I don't like the disputatiousness. You didn't even know that was a word, did you? Yeah, see, that, Anne Rice, that's how smart she is, right? I, I had to practice saying that just so I could get up here and not look like a moron, right? Disputatious, okay. Basically, Rice says, look, I'm going to follow Jesus, but I don't want to be any part of that. I don't want to be any part of that. And I'm willing to bet some of you have felt that way. Maybe you're watching online, and you're sitting there right now where you're sitting, and you're thinking to yourself, amen. And you're not even religious, but you want to shout the word amen, right? It just comes out of you somewhere. Anne keeps going. Listen. My conversion from a pessimistic atheist lost in a world that I didn't understand to an optimistic believer in a universe created and sustained by a loving God is crucial to me. In other words, she confesses, I am redeemed. I am a new person. I have been redeemed. I see the world differently than I used to see it. I don't see it like I used to anymore. I don't want to go back to my atheist, pessimistic, 
unbelieving past. I don't want to go back there. In another interview, she said this, my commitment to Christ remains at the heart and center of my life. Transformation in him is radical and ongoing. That I feel now that I am called to be an outsider for him, to step away from the words Christian and Christianity is something that my conscience demands of me. In other words, she says, I can't continue to follow Jesus and be associated with Christianity. Now, again, some of you in here are thinking, yes, somebody finally said it. Others of you are listening to that and going, whoa, I am profoundly uncomfortable with that. Fair enough. No matter where you land with this, at some time in your life, haven't you felt that? Like some news story comes on, or you read some article, and it, some Christians, somebody who calls themselves a Christian, is doing something stupid, and you're like, ugh, I wish I was not associated with those people. Or maybe you've got kids or grandkids or in their teens or 20s, and, and, and they are fed up with the hostility and the bickering and the nastiness of Christians, and you're struggling because you're like, I kind of agree with you, but I don't want you to walk away from faith, and I, I, I want it both ways, but I don't know how to have it. And here's where we can use Anne's word. Christians are so disputatious. <laughs> like, I wish you weren't like that, but they are. Like, we have all felt torn. Because Jesus, I mean, you, you study and look at the life of Jesus. Jesus is so compelling. Everything he says, you're like, yeah, that's good. But everything Christian? Yeah. Maybe, maybe Anne's not off target. I mean, we talked about this last week. Pastor Paul introduced us to this. The word Christian can mean anything people want it to mean, right? A Christian, that word is not defined in the New Testament. So it, it was first used in the Bible as a derogatory term. Like people looked over there and went, oh, those Christ ones, those Christians, those weirdos. And people labeled Jesus followers Christians. And then eventually Jesus' people took the word and adopted it. And they said, yes, I am a Christian. And they were willing to die in the name of Christ as a Christian. But today... And that word means anything. That's why every issue in the world, there are Christians on both sides of it, right? Since the New Testament doesn't define the word Christian, it can literally mean anything people want it to mean. People call themselves Christian and take any position, represent any point of view. And last week, Pastor Paul opened up the New Testament, and we discovered that Jesus didn't call his followers Christians. He called his followers something else. Jesus called his followers disciples. And all over the New Testament and in first century Christianity, Jesus' people called themselves disciples. Now, that little word's scary because it's defined. It means something. If you call yourself a Christian, well, that can mean anything you want it to mean, right? But if you call yourself a disciple, well, now you're kind of on the hook. It, it means something substantive. So last week, we jumped into the New Testament and again, Paul read some of these passages. I'm going to share, review a little bit of that. But Jesus defined this word, and that's where I want to take you this morning. And here's what Jesus said to his followers. If you forget everything that I told you, if you forget everything else I say, I've got one commandment I want you to follow. And, I, you know, Matthew and Luke and all these guys, John, they're, they're sitting around thinking, well, I thought there were like 10 commandments. In fact, there's a bunch of commandments. Jesus says, no, 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 I got one. But it's a big one, okay? It's a big commandment. And before we jump into that commandment, review of last week, can I just talk to the men for a minute? Men. Men struggle with what I'm about to talk about. Jesus said, this is the one thing that will mark you as my disciples. But the problem is when you hear this, it seems so passive. Maybe even feminine. Like, hey, that's just not going to work in my world. I mean, you, you can talk about that all you want, but that's great for Sunday school, Pastor Mike. Like, Mike, I hear you, but that, that doesn't work in the world I live in. Outside these walls, what you're talking about here, it doesn't work. In the business world, in my job site, that word does not work anymore. And I think one reason guys in particular struggle with this concept is because when we hear Jesus speak these words, this is the picture we get. That ain't Jesus. Okay? That is not the Jesus speaking in the New Testament. So if you get stuck here, let me help you out a little bit. 
If you want to know what Jesus meant by what he said, watch what Jesus did. That's how you know what he meant by what he said. Watch what he did. And men, before we get to this verse, and you're tempted to skip over it because it's... uh, I want you to remember that this, not that, the guy we're talking about, Jesus, this 30-year-old guy, marched into the city of Jerusalem knowing that he was going to be arrested and killed. Most of you wouldn't do that. I wouldn't do that. This guy, Jesus, grew up seeing rotting corpses on Roman crosses. They were on the side of the road. It's not something he read about in a book. This was something he actually smelled as he walked around. It's what every Jew and every person in the Roman Empire feared most. And Jesus knew that that was his fate, that he was going to be one of those corpses on a cross. When he walked into Jerusalem, he went there anyway. And he had several chances to recant, but he didn't. He knew he was going to be railroaded. He knew he was going to be put to a gruesome death. And so before you dismiss what Jesus says this morning as soft, I want you to remember who said it and what he did. If you want to understand what Jesus meant by what he said, watch what Jesus did. So Jesus goes into Jerusalem. And when, he, when you hear this verse, this is the last night before he gets arrested and killed. Okay, So these are his last words to his followers. He tells them, guys, if you forget everything else, don't forget this. This is the Gospel of John, chapter 13. This is Thursday night before he's arrested. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Wait, 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 Jesus. I thought the way people would know we were your disciples is by what we believed. Like there was a list of things, we just believed these things, check, 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 check. That, no, no, no. I mean, there are some things you need to know, but nobody can look at what you believe. They can't see your beliefs, right? Well, I thought you wanted us to be Christians. And Jesus says, no, no, I don't want you to be Christians. I want you to be disciples. But Jesus, that's so narrow, and you make it so hard. Yeah? Yeah, that's true. And the thing that will mark you as my disciples is how well you love one another. Several decades later, after uh, John wrote the Gospel of John, several decades later after this happened, John is an old man. Same guy who wrote this, he's an old man now. He's in his 80s, perhaps. He has seen and lived through so much in those 80 years. He has seen or heard about Jerusalem being sacked by the Romans. Thousands of his Jewish countrymen, tens of thousands, killed and hauled back as slaves to the Roman Empire. The temple, the beautiful, massive, incredible temple, was completely destroyed. And John is an old man now. He knows about Peter. Peter, who was hauled off to Rome and crucified, tradition says, upside down. He knows about Peter. He knows about Paul. Paul, who had started all these churches, but himself was arrested and taken to Rome and eventually led outside the city of Rome and beheaded by the Romans. John is one of the only ones left now. as an old man. So many of his friends are gone. Almost all the disciples are gone that he knows of. They're either murdered, they're in prison, they're in exile. He had seen Roman emperors come and go starting with Tiberius, who was Caesar when Jesus was crucified, then Caligula, who you may have heard about, the days of Caligula, John lived through that, Nero, Emperor Nero, John had lived through that and the persecutions. John had seen bloodshed that you and I could never imagine seeing. He had seen it firsthand. And he sits down to write a letter to Jesus' people, the people of Jesus all over the Roman Empire. John sits down to write a letter, and he can write anything he wants. He's John. He's the John, okay? This guy walks into town, and people go, it's John. Hey, it's John. It's your John's in town. He can say and write anything he wants, and everyone will listen to him. And here's what he says. Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Really, John? You still hanging on to that? Like, John, everybody else is dead, man. Like, Jesus' followers are scattered. They're persecuted. The Romans have executed a bunch of them. All you got is love one another? (laughs) I mean, that's not a very good strategy, John. Isn't there something else? John says, everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. 
Whoever does not love does not know God because, in other words, John says, the key characteristic, the key characteristic of the way that you know that someone is a Jesus follower, the way that you know whether they're a godly person, is how well they love. But wait a minute, my preacher, he's not a real loving guy, but man, he can preach. John says, nope, that ain't it. Well, yeah, but there's this lady who leads Bible study at my church, and man, she is cranky, and you do not want to get in her way because she's kind of nasty, but she's such a good Bible study leader. Nope, that ain't it. Because God is love. You see, if you asked people to describe God, like list all the characteristics of God, they'd probably start with some fancy theological words like omniscient or omnipotent or omnipresent or, you know, he's powerful and big and Maybe you go to the Old Testament and you say, oh, he's like king or Lord or Yahweh. Or maybe you go to the New Testament and you call him Savior, Redeemer, right? John says, hey, look, that's all true. But the main thing that God is, the primary thing that God is, God's essence is love. That's his primary characteristic. But John, how can you say that, man? I mean, did you see what the Romans did to Jerusalem? Yeah, I saw it. Did you see what happened to Peter and Paul? Did you hear that Matthew was burned at the stake? Yeah, yeah, I heard that. And you still believe that God is love? And John says, yeah. And I want to tell you why I know that. Here's what John says. This is how God showed his love among us. Don't miss that word among us. That's not a video game from your phone from five years ago. Well, here's what John is saying. Were you tempted to skip over that? John says, I was there. I saw it. I didn't read about it. I didn't get somebody's story about it. I saw it. It happened right in front of me. And I will never doubt the love of God because of what I saw, John says. He, God, sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. You say, well, hey, I remember that verse. That's like John 3.16, right? And John says, yeah, I wrote that. That's in the other book I wrote. <laughs> yeah, that was me. That's what happened. John keeps going. Listen. He says, this is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Us. Our. Us. Our. Do you know what that means, friends? That means that every person in your life, every person you encounter in the world is someone that God loves and that God sent his son to atone and redeem and rescue from sin. Wait a minute. My mother-in-law? Yes, she's one of the us's and ours. Your brother-in-law? Do you know that guy? Your boss? The president of your HOA? They are part of the us and our that God has sent his son to be a redeeming and an atoning sacrifice for. Your math teacher, the people at your office, the guy who cut you off in traffic on your way to church this morning. They are all included in what John says here, that God sent his son for us to be an atoning sacrifice for our sins. And John says to you and I this morning, this morning God says this to you and I, this isn't just a theory. This isn't something I read about. I saw it happen, John says. And all these years later, all these decades later, I am as convinced as ever that Jesus was the Son of God and the atoning sacrifice for all of our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. Ought. E Boy, that, that term implies indebtedness, doesn't it? In fact, we just sang about this a few minutes ago. Because he loves us so, what is our response to that? There's a debt-debtor relationship in the gospel that I think it's important that you understand as a follower of Jesus. There's a debt-debtor relationship with the people that you meet in your life, the people who live in your home. John's basic argument is this. Since God loved us so much, we owe it to God to love other people. I owe it to God to love you. Since God loved others, I owe it to God to do the same for the other people in my life. Since God loved you, you owe it to God to love me. 
And every time I am tempted to return evil for evil because of what that guy did or what that lady said, I have to remember, wait a minute, I owe it to God to love you. And I don't love you because you deserve it, because you're such a wonderful person, I can't help but love you. I owe it to God to love you because God loved me first. God chose me. He chose to love and redeem me, and he chose to love and redeem you. And since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. Not because, and this is important too, not because if you don't, God's going to get you, like he'll punish you. You didn't love enough like I told you to. No, because you've been given this incredible, eternally magnificent, beautiful gift, and God wants you to pass it on to the people in your life. God says to you and me, friends, you don't have to pay me back. I want you to take my gift and give it to the people in your life. I want you to love others so that no one will ever again say about my people. They are a quarrelsome, hostile, disputatious, and deservedly infamous group. God wants that to go away, friends. God wants that erased from people's minds. But the only way for that to happen is for us to take seriously the command of Jesus, to love one another as he has loved us. Now, I'm just guessing here, but I think if Anne had experienced that kind of love, she would not have quit Christianity. If God's people that she encountered had had gotten that right, if they had embodied that kind of love, Not with a hundred commandments or ten commandments, but just that one new commandment of Jesus. I don't think people quit that. People don't walk away from, boy, he sure loved me. He didn't even have any reason to. He just loved me. He was kind, compassionate. People don't walk away from, they accepted me unconditionally. People don't walk away from, I don't know why, he just forgave me. She didn't hold my past against me. People don't quit that. So maybe Anne's got a point. Maybe it's time that we stop being Christians and started living as disciples of Jesus. You hear what I'm saying? What if just for a month, just just for the rest of October, we decided to quit Christianity and decided instead to sacrificially love people like disciples of Jesus? What if just for the rest of 2022, just just through December 31st, then we can get back in January to our disputatious, quarrelsome, and hostile ways, all right? We'll get back to it. There's plenty of time. What if just for a little while we practice this? Can you imagine if you did this in your home, in your marriage, with your kids, with your parents? Can you imagine if you started doing this in your school, in your neighborhood? on the community Facebook page? In the city of Katy? Can you imagine what would happen if we actually started to live this out? I'll tell you what would happen. Because it's the same thing that happened in the first century when Jesus lived and the apostles carried his message on. Here's what would happen. The people in your life, they would begin to say to you, you know, I don't feel coerced or ashamed, but I do feel drawn to be with them. Like, Sometimes when I'm with them, those Jesus people, sometimes when I'm with them, I feel kind of guilty, actually. I mean, that lady just told the truth. I don't even know why. I would have just lied. I never would have told the truth like that. And I feel a little guilty because she's such a truth teller. She's so honest. I'm not that honest. He just, he just came up to me at the office and admitted he'd made a mistake and apologized. I mean, nobody does that. I feel kind of guilty when he did that but I don't feel condemned. He wasn't after me. He was just trying to be honest. I mean, look at their relationship. It's just, it's just better than mine. I mean, they fight fair. They respect each other even when they're having an argument. It's like they're fighting for their marriage instead of against each other. I don't do that in my marriage. I feel a little guilty, but I don't feel condemned. Like they're not coming after me. I heard how generous those Jesus people were. I mean, they give even when they have so little to give. And their giving makes an impact on the world. I'm so glad they give, but honestly, I'm not that generous. And I feel a little guilty. 
but I don't feel condemned. You, you see, it's, it's, friends, this is not rocket science. What Je- the job Jesus gave us to do is not that hard. It's not complicated. But our modern church, the modern church's problem is that we have settled. We have settled for the brand Christian And we gave up our leverage and our influence when we opted for something other than love. So here's what I want you to do. And men, this isn't passive. You remember how Jesus showed his love. It was pretty brutal. It's probably time for a lot of men in this room to man up and be more like Jesus. We all need that. It's time to adopt a new perspective, okay? Because because God loved me, Now, I'm called to take that love to the people in my life. What if we focused on that? Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. And look, I'm telling you right now, if you try this, it's going to be messy, okay? It's not simple. I mean, it's not hard to do this, but it gets messy fast, learning how to love people. It's not going to be easy, all right? But if we're going to struggle over something, isn't that what we should be struggling over? Wouldn't that be a struggle, a disputation worth having? The, this right here, friends, this is the best opportunity for your family. This is the best opportunity for your marriage. This is the best opportunity for Crossroad Church. And this is the best opportunity for the city of Katy, for God's people everywhere. Let's learn to love one another as our Heavenly Father has already loved us in Christ. And don't miss next week. Let me pray for you. Jesus, this morning we want to come to you and confess that we have settled. We have settled for being Christians. And we have filled that word with any meaning we wanted to give it. But God, you didn't call us to be Christians. You called us to be followers of Jesus. You called us to be disciples. And a disciple, Jesus, you already told us, a disciple will be marked by how well they loved one another. And so, Lord, you have given us very clear marching orders. We pretend like we're confused. We don't know what we're doing. We're not sure how to function day to day as your people. But it's really not that hard, Jesus. You said you wanted us to be disciples and to make disciples. And a disciple was somebody who took the love you had given them and passed it on to the other people in their life. So, Lord, teach us to love. Send us to love. And help us, Lord, to be light in the darkness in our marriages, in our homes, in our social media, in our workplaces, with our kids and our parents. May we love others as you have loved us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.